Okay. All right. What a beautiful theme. What a beautiful theme we've been unfolding in this year. And the last three months, including this month, I wanted to do a deeper excursion into parts of the brain, layers of the brain, in order for us to then be able to tackle understanding character structures, which are related to the five core soul wounds. That's what's coming up June, July. But before we get there, I want to finish talking about the layers of the brain. So just a quick recap. Two months ago, I spoke about the brainstem. And your brainstem kind of corresponds to your root chakra in many ways. It's your, your basic survival instinct. It's your basic instinct of how to take care of your body and make sure that your body is safe. And then last month, we went into the limbic brain, which in many ways you can equate with the sacral chakra because it's about your emotional it's about your emotional reality your emotional reality with yourself and your emotional reality the emotional dynamics that you're involved in it's called your tribal brain and it's the mammalian brain we have it in common with all the mammals which if you hang out with a dog or a cat long enough you have no difficulty understanding that they have emotions and there's emotional complexity going on there so Tonight, what I want to hone in on is the cortex and the neocortex. So the cortex is up here, and the neocortex is this whole chunk where the forehead is. And the way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to structure the teaching I want to give you around the fact that the cortex is kind of like your plexus chakra. Your cortex is your ability to logically understand and assess what needs to happen, how you need to interact with someone, et cetera. It's not, it's not emotional. It's very much mental in order to get things done, in order to get what you need, in order to, to get what you want. We call it, we also call the, the solar plexus the social chakra because it's about how to interact with others. And now we're not at the tribal level anymore. We're not in a small family. We're not in a mommy acts like this, therefore all women are like this. Daddy acts like this, therefore all men are like this. We're not there anymore. We're not in that tight knit little tribe anymore. We're like in, we're in society, like we're in, it's like, it's like, I don't want to say colder, but it's like, Durkheim was really good at talking about that, actually. I'm remembering my sociolo sociology background. Like, I think the difference between a very small village and an actual city, and that, that'll start giving you an idea of the difference between tribal programming and actual social programming. Social programming, um, is more, I want to say pervasive, but it's, it's, it's hard to talk about that like that. I have to say pervasive. Let me reformulate that. That societal instinct, okay? It's not the instinct of protecting your body anymore. It's not the emotional instinct of how to be in a small knit group in order to get your needs met. All of a sudden, it's how to be in a big group of people with who you don't have personal relationships. You know, so it's a whole other level that starts kicking into gear and it's much more abstract because, you know, it's like you, you play roles in society, you know, he's an engineer, he's a this, he's a that, that this guy picks up the garbage and that. you don't have relationships with any of these people yet you depend on them for your survival in the sense that, you know, they, they put the pavement, they pick up the garbage so that your house doesn't stink, <laughs> things like that. Like, so we're becoming more and more abstract as we're going up into the layers of the brain. The cortex is also what we share with monkeys. Okay. So monkeys have, are able to use logical reasoning up to a certain point. Like my example was like a monkey can eventually figure out how to crack a nut with a rock by banging the rock on the nut. And then all of a sudden the, it cracks open the shell and then he's able to eat what's inside the nut. Right. You're not going to see, you're not going to see a wolf doing that. Like just, first of all, they don't have like hands that would allow them to do something like that, but they, they don't quite have the level of abstraction needed to, to understand a puzzle like that. So that's this part, the cortex, it's a puzzle solver. It's a problem solver. And then we've got this beautiful 
thing we have that separates us from monkeys and mammals and reptiles, a neocortex, which allows us to go into intuitive thinking, which allows us to go into broad picture thinking, which allows us to think in a way that we can like stretch far, far, far into the future and consider, you know, the consequences of our actions, for example, which the other animals don't have that and they don't, they don't need it. They're kind of plugged in directly with, you know, the universal intelligence and they, they just kind of know what to do without needing to know what to do. We get to have that brain that starts questioning, <laughs> hmm, should I do that? What should I do? Mm -mm. That could seem like it puts us in a lot of trouble, but it's because we're, we're like in between, we're like, we're like quantum leaping into another level of, of evolution. And we are getting close to the point where we, we will be able to transcend the logical mind, which doesn't mean we stop using it, but we stop depending on it as the means to analyze and assess and function with everything. Because that's kind of where we're stuck right now. Most humans are still stuck. We are, we have put, we have put a mental field over almost everything. And most of us don't know how to interact with these things without that mental field anymore. The way you interact with things without a mental field is, you know, through the brainstem, like that pure instinct, like it's gut level understanding of how to do something or how to get out of the way before you get hit by a stone or a car. And the emotional brain is like, it's just natural empathy, things that we just looking at someone's face and, and how they're reacting gives you a lot of information and a lot of intelligence. None of that is mental, you know? The mental side will kick in and be like, mm, I wonder why they're feeling like that. Okay, fine, whatever. But that's where we're kind of stuck right now. Well, we're, we're getting unstuck out of it, but that's where we've been for a long time. So what I want to have fun with tonight is I want to do a meditation where we're going to tap into these four layers of the brain through an understanding of the three base layer, the three base chakras, the three subtle, three base subtle bodies and their colors, and then kind of bring it up into the heart to connect it to the, the upper three chakras, which are more, that's what we want the divine, that's what we want the neocortex to be connected to more and more is the ability to see to see and understand and feel the much broader picture, what quantum physics called fundamental creativity, different from situational creativity. And yeah, so that's, I've been having a lot of fun feeling into that. And I'm like, oof, okay, I'm not going to talk too much tonight. And we're going to go and, into that pretty quickly. But of course, there's still a couple of things I want to say because... This is all super yummy information and understanding how your brain processes information and trauma is one of the greatest tools you can have to understand what's going on when you need to shift where you're looking at what's going on from. So the problem with us being so honed into the cortex is that your cortex sees everything as a problem needing a solution. And that's perfectly fine if we're talking about how do I get the nut out of that shell? That's perfectly fine if we're talking from that level. That's, that's a problem, it's a puzzle, and it needs to be solved. When we're talking about traumas or childhood wounds or deep emotions that need to be felt, this part, can't really help you with that. And of all things, this part of the brain, the cortex, is aware that there's some kind of problem and it's trying to solve it logically. And it's not logical. First of all, it's not a problem. <laughs> it's an emotion that needs to be felt, you know, or it's an instinct that needs to be calmed down. So it's not really a problem. And even more importantly, it's not logical. I think we've all heard that quote from Einstein. You can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness where, you, where it was created. Think about that as being able to go up or down. So it's not just 
you have to go higher up to find the solution to a problem because if you go higher up, you'll see that it's not even a problem anymore. But maybe sometimes we go, we need to go lower. Maybe sometimes, you know, what your cortex is freaking out about and trying to find a solution to, like, I'm not feeling well. Okay, what's wrong? What, well, what's wrong? What do I need to do? Do I need to like, do I need to put more clothes on? Do I need to like, uh, do I need to like uh, drink some water? Do I need to this? Do I need to that? It's because of him. It's because of that. I need to move. I need to leave. I need to this. It's none of that. Most of the time, it's like, I need to feel. I need to feel it. I don't need to think about it more. <laughs> and we're, we're all pretty good at that. We're all pretty good at overthinking things that at the end of the day, just require, they just require that you be willing to feel them. They are not a mental problem. They are an emotion. They are an energy in you that needs to be met where it is. Hmm? It's like the body needs to be aligned with the body. Not with the mind. The mind has its own alignment. The body needs to be aligned with the body. The emotional reality needs to be aligned with the emotions. The mental reality needs to be aligned with the mind. And then it goes on and on, like the heart, the interpersonal field, and et cetera, et cetera. But this is what we tend to do. Our mind, I'm talking about the cortex when I say the mind, is trying to solve a problem, which in reality, it will never be able to solve because it's not a problem and it's not logical. It's deeper in the body or it's higher up in the mind. And believe it or not, there's a lot of relief to be had there. Because if your mind is spinning and it can't figure out how to find the solution to the problem, the only solution is to stop thinking about it. <laughs> the mind's like, <laughs> it's not mental it's like if we're carrying an energy in our field or we have damage in one of our energy bodies because of a trauma of when we were three that is there it is present in the body the emotional reality is aware of it because your limbic brain and your your reptilian brain are they're almost they're very together you know they can't tell the difference between each other they're together there something's going on there you know the instinct is like revving up because it's like danger danger and then the emotional brain is kind of like okay danger okay danger like and then the cortex is feeling all of that the cortex can feel there's something going on but it doesn't understand where it's coming from it's kind of weird to think about this, but they don't really communicate these layers together. From the neocortex, from us becoming more and more intuitively aligned with our higher self and our higher heart and our higher mind, we can, we are the ones, our consciousness can communicate with all these layers of the brain. But you cannot ask your instinctual brain to communicate with your neocortex. And you can't expect your logical brain to be able to communicate with parts of the brain that are archaic and non-logical. It's like, whatever, what's that expression? That expression, apples and oranges or something? It's just like, it's, they're not talking the same language. You as the conscious being, your job is to understand these different layers and how they function so that you can communicate with them. This is super awesome to realize, right? Like this, your intuitive brain, like dolphins have this thing like this big too. Like they, it's like super, super developed. Your intuitive brain is what can talk with these other parts. While there are still traumas going on in there, the information is coming like this. It's going through the, the instincts, through the survival instincts and the fear brain into the tribal brain, into the logical brain. And then it gets to the cortex. By the time it gets to the cortex, 
it's already all convoluted. It's already all jumbled up with a bunch of programs of survival that came in. And what we want to do is the more we get our base frequency at a high enough level that we can be living from this brain, then we can start reversing. We can reverse. Information can come and we can actually receive it here. And let it filter through the layers. So this is, I, I don't even know, like this, I'm getting shivers. This is like next level shit. This is quantum brain. This is quantum mind thinking. I give you the example of situational creativity and fundamental creativity. Situational creativity is you can come up with a solution to something based on what was there before, right? It's like, it's situational. It's 3D thinking. Fundamental creativity is 5D thinking. It is completely radical, completely able to connect to the entire field, the entire quantum field of infinite possibilities and just, just, just pull in new ideas, new ways of doing things that in many ways even eradicate the idea itself of there being a problem. So that's where we're at. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's nice to meditate because that's what we're doing, right? We're feeding that part of the brain. That's what we're doing every time we meditate together, really. We're like calming down the processors so that we have more and more access to the intuitive mind, which is connected to everything, which is connected to whatever, you know, however you want to see the universe that we're in, like all the different energies and intelligences and beings and our past lives and all of that is accessible through the neocortex. So imagine that, you know, like while we are still running, while there are still traumas in our bodies, while there are still energies that are split in our bodies, because that's the whole theme this year, right? Healing the split. So we've got a trauma happens, there is a separation that happens between the hardcore pure emotion that the three-year-old you didn't know what to do with, and the thought process and the memory of it that gets separated. And then we have the memory of things that have happened, but we're not feeling what happened. And then our job is to go and actually feel these things. Our job is to create a container where our body feels safe enough to allow us to go into these parts and feel these energies and bring them up, bring them up to consciousness, bring them up through the central line so that the mental memory and the emotional feeling can come back together and be freed out through the crown, back into the ether. This is very exciting. I get, I get a little bit too excited sometimes and I can kind of like, <laughs> I want to go play with the quantum mind. Situational creativity is what the cortex does. Situational creativity is what our neocortex does when it is stuck trying to see things only through the programs, through the survival programs, through the tribal family emotional dynamic programs of how we need to be to be accepted or how we need to be to be loved or how we need to be to be blah, blah, blah. Like we want to clear all that. We want to clear it out. It's like, it's time. It's time. Whatever is for our highest good, whatever ensures our survival, it doesn't need to be an automated thing anymore. I'm not saying we want to, take out our, our reptilian brain and, and not know to jump out of a, the, the way if there's a car coming, that'll still work. That's fine. That's like, that's like full on pure physical intuition. That's good. That's fear-based intuition. That's good. It's okay that we have that. We need it probably literally 0.5% of the time. And for most of us, it's on 70% of the time. So that's what I mean by, we don't need the, we can, 
slow that down. A couple of mantras I've been using recently in the last calls that I, I want to come back to is like, you know, the way we work with the instinctual brain is we feel the fear, just feel the fear so that that instinct can calm down. And how do we work with the tribal brain? We flow the emotions, right? So feel the fear. It's like, oh, my body's having a reaction. I want to run away. I want to go hide. I want to attack, whatever. Like, okay, feel the fear. Next level, flow the emotions that that's involving. It's like, oh my God, it doesn't matter what I do. It's never going to work, oh, whatever. Like, feeling it, feeling the actual emotion, not the mm, feeling it. And that's what allows to calm the anxiety. The anxiety is going on here, right? Calm down the fear. Let the emotions know they're safe to be felt. That's how we calm down the anxiety. That's how we calm down the mind that's trying to like find the solution, find the solution, find the solution to something that's not happening at its level. It's not a puzzle. <laughs> Your emotional reality and your emotional needs are not a puzzle that needs to be solved. They are energies that need to be felt and met. We're not puzzles. <laughs> We're not objects with little pieces. Oh, if we put that piece back, it'll be fine. No. Of all things, if you can start looking at yourself as the image instead of the pieces it's getting a little bit closer to what you really are and that's getting close to starting to see through the intuitive brain that doesn't look at you like a puzzle to be solved it looks at you as an entire being There's something else I'd like to say, but I'm I'm gonna see how it wants to come in. When I talked about the three layers of the brain two months ago when I presented the reptilian brain, I also explained to you that between zero and six years old, we have like the mini version of each of these instincts, the the survival instinct, the intimacy instinct, and the social instinct. And based on which one of these instincts was wounded the most, i.e. when your core wound happened between zero and two, two and four, or four and six, right? That affects which limbic zone you tend to go into. So when it's before two, we tend to do more the freeze thing. When it's between two and four, we tend to do more the intimacy instinct. And when it's between four and six, we tend to do more of the flight, social instinct. That was like a mini version, right? Because, And I also explained that there's like the zero to seven, seven to 14, and 14 to 21 cycles within us. The zero to seven years old is when we build our physical integrity, how to feel safe in the world. It's like the root chakra building and, and hopefully building up in a very healthy way, like feeling safe running and using your body and being fed and having a roof and things like that. Then seven to 14, we go through the emotional. It's like the biggest phase of our emotional de development. We go through puberty. We go through a whole bunch of funky stuff between seven and 14. And then between 14 and 21, we go through our mental development. The most active part of our mental development is when we start layering we start layering the world with judgments and opinions and ways of seeing. It's when we're solidifying our map of reality. You know, so before seven, it's very like in the body, gut feeling. Between seven and 14, it's it's more emotional, like mythical, like. And then 14 to 21 is the most important period of time in terms of the development of your ego in its linguistic aspect so its ability to put words on things and put meanings on things so
So the reality is if we're coming from a wounded place, by the time we get to 14, from 14 to 21, we are building a reality. We are building ourselves a reality that has layers and layers of judgments and opinions. And if you remember what I was just explaining to you, a lot of these judgments and opinions are based on things going on below that level, but that part of the brain isn't isn't actively connected to what actually happened. So for example, you have your survival instinct gets affected when you're two years old. You have this deep wound when you're two. I don't know, your dad leaves, whatever, like something happens. Your cycle, your emotional cycle from seven to 14, you know, you have all these like longings and this and that and no, 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 like longing for, you don't know what you're longing for, but you know you're longing for something. And then all of a sudden 14 hits and then you start deciding, well, that's just the way the world, that's just the way the world is. You know, men ditch you. You just don't trust, don't ever trust men. Like no man will ever stick around and be with you. And you just start like, I'm speaking from experience. That's kind of what, <laughs> that's part of the, the, the stuff that I came up with as a teenager. Remember what I was telling you about like how we're kind of living in a world where we're interfacing with reality based on our mind and what our mind has decided. Well, it all kind of like, that's the most important constructive part of it. And imagine it's being done on the base of deeper levels that are wounded, deeper levels that weren't processed. Because most of us didn't have adults around us that could help us through these events and help us understand what we're feeling, what we're going through. More importantly, most of us didn't have parents that were able to hold their ground when we went through adolescence. <laughs> when we started being becoming like judgmental and, and reactive and this and that, and we would have needed them to be able to stay super solid, non-reactive to our reactivity so that we could actually just go through it without, without receiving how much it's affecting the outer environment. And for most of us, if we would have had parents with deep, deep integrity within them that weren't affected by our behaviors and our words and our judgments, it would have been a lot easier for most of us to go through our adolescence. It's, it's a weird thing to, as, I don't know what parenting is going to look like in like 200 years, but it's going to be different from what's been going on. I. It's going to be different from this. We can't ask anyone to be that for us anymore. We have to be that. We have to be these parents. We have to be that parent for ourselves. And that's kind of what I'm talking about when we start living from here. That's what we're doing. We're being that divine parent. It's like, oh, okay. My body's having a reaction. It wants to run away. Okay. Let me just be there for that. Let me feel the fear. Oh, this emotion wants to come up and attack this other person and scream and this and that and then and then whatever or cry. All right, let me be there for that. Let me flow the emotions through my body. Oh, I can tell the judgments that want to kick in about the situation and how the judgments want to solve the problem. Okay, I can hear these thoughts without reacting to them. Now that I've done all that, what do I choose to do in this situation? That's responsiveness. Feel the fear, flow the emotions, calm the anxiety. And then what can I do in this situation now? Ironically enough, most of the time, there isn't anything to do. Because if you've taken care of these three things, <laughs> your new critics will be like, it's all good. You take care of these three things, the people around you will also be affected and most likely get out of their own reactivity because you're not in a reaction anymore. And then it could just be like, all right, now what? All right, well, let's, uh, let's go for a drink or let's go for a walk or whatever. Like, So sometimes... The best thing to do is nothing. <laughs> There's nothing to do. Just be. Just feel what comes up and be with it. 
let that then inform you of what needs to happen. And I'm telling you, I'll repeat it again, most of the time, that's all that was needed was for you to get really present, really present. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Just waiting to see anything else. Okay. Okay, so that's that's it for the that's it for kind of like mental stuff. I can already feel like the cortex, like you know, these parts of our body, these layers of our brain, by us coming to them from a place of consciousness, from a place of tenderness and presence they feel it this is all alive they feel it and it's it gets more and more yummy for them because they're like oh yes they get to have an hour of tlc right now from us so get comfy whatever you need to do And I'm going to have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's all kicking into gear already. So <laughs> if you need a glass of water, blanket, get ready, lay down, etc. And I will start the meditation in a couple of minutes. If you're seeing this video on YouTube, you can read into the description to see how you can join us for the meditations. <laughs> 